Don't steal my umbrella. <laughs> so thanks so much for coming out for our uh, monthly public policy and practice uh, series. So this is our, our chance as kind of a, a fells and, and community to get to talk to um, public leaders and, and public servants and people who work um, in the government and nonprofit space, um, kind of about their careers and, and their thoughts on government and, and government reform. So we're delighted tonight to have uh, Dr. Paul Light, who is the NYU Wagner School's Paulette Goddard Professor of Public Service and the founding principal investigator of the Global Center for Public Service. So he has a long and distinguished career um, both in the public sector and in academia. Uh, he served previously as the Douglas Dillon Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institute, founding director of the Center for Public, his Center for Public Service, and was vice president and director of the Governmental Studies Program. He also served as director of the Public Policy Program at the Pew Charitable Trust, and associate dean and professor of public affairs at the University of Minnesota's uh, Hubert Humphrey Institute of Public Affairs. He also was a special consultant to the 1988 National Commission on the Public Service, chaired by former Federal Reserve Board Chairman Paul Volcker, and today works with the Volcker Alliance on issues of governmental reform. He's a frequent commentator on issues of public service and public policy, has testified on public service issues before the U.S. Congress over three dozen times in the past two decades, is the author of 26 books, uh, which four have won national awards, and he literally wrote the book on how to make government service more effective, um, a government that will execute the decline of the federal service and how to reverse it. Um, and in recognition of this long career, he was awarded the 2015 John Gallus Award from the EDSA. So I can think of almost no one better suited to speak to us on these issues of government service and government reform than Professor Light. So please join me in welcoming uh, him uh, here this evening. Thank you. I got, the, uh, I got appointed to the Paul at Goddard professorship at NYU, and I should say that my dad didn't understand a thing about what I did. That whole bio and stuff is like, what's that? Uh, he was 93 when I was appointed. Um, and I went to him and I said, I've been appointed uh, to the, be the Paul at Goddard professor at NYU. And he said, oh my God. Paul at Goddard, she was wonderful in The Little Dictator. Uh, she was a, a star of silent film. And she made the precarious and ultimately, uh, this on, on forecasting outcomes, uh, she had been presented, at least this is the story about her, she had been given uh, an opportunity to read for and be cast as Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind. That is the story about her. And she said, that's going nowhere. No <laughs> films, talkies, no way. And that's, uh, that was everything. But uh, uh, I'm really delighted to be here. I, I, I love him. I think there's so much capacity here. It's nice to be back in Philly. I was here for uh, four or five years, um, took the six train every night to uh, the Battle of Kenwood, um, which was a precarious uh, experience in its own way, exciting and interesting. <laughs> so I, I'm delighted. I, I love this school and, and this university. It's, it's terrific. So congrats to you. Uh, my dad would say, really? Great. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so uh, I thought we'd start with just some sort of questions, uh, and then we'll open it up uh, to the audience in a little bit. Uh, so you've written quite a bit about a government failure and how we can, can learn to improve, um, in particular the role of structure and leadership. Um, so I thought those might be interesting topics uh, for this audience. Can you talk a little bit about how those um, factors can help us learn from past failures and learn how to do better in the future? Wow. That's a fairly narrow uh, question. I did this study a few years ago. Uh, we took... Um, uh, story, or we took incidents that had received a fair amount of coverage in the media, federal government breakdowns, things that had gone wrong, like 9-11, uh, the response to Hurricane Katrina, uh, we would have done the response to Hurricane Maria, these kinds of things, uh, Deepwater Horizon, where the federal government uh, could have prevented, uh, might have reacted differently, and said, well, look what happened now. 
uh, you know, what went wrong? And of course, this was this did not make me popular uh, <laughs> with colleagues. They were like, why can't you focus on success? What's the matter with you? Um, but we thought that failure was a good teacher. And Mr. Volker, uh, uh, with whom I've worked for many uh, years off and on, uh, had this phrase that he kept repeating over and over that he claimed came from Thomas Edison. I, I can't find a reference to it, but that um, vision without execution is hallucination. <laughs> that we've got plenty of great policies that get adopted. We've got plenty of great laws that promise no child left behind or you know access for everybody, blah, blah, blah. We've got plenty of vision, but not enough execution. Um, this is also attributed, this, this statement is also attributed, uh, or often linked, uh, described as an ancient uh, Japanese proverb about vision without uh, delivery uh, is daydreaming. And uh, so we looked at all of these cases of visible failures that had been recorded in the Pew um, Research Center surveys on news uh, attention by the American public. What were they paying attention to? 9-11, the Challenger, shuttle accident, the Columbia shuttle accidents, these kinds of things. And we tried to figure out what the proximate cause was. It was not a lack of vision, it was a lack of execution over and over again. The choice of the wrong contractor, corruption in the system, poorly designed uh, and you know heavily constrained policy, not enough flexibility, too much flexibility, you know? so. It ended up that we could not find a proximate cause for pretty much anything. Uh, just lots of stress points that you need to be aware of when you're in the business of delivering policy. But we did find that underinvestment in uh, systems, people, um, training, uh, the, the thickening of government with needless layers of, of, of uh, reporting layers so that information can't flow up fast enough. We found lots of examples where delivery becomes, you know, very important and policy is not self-executing. It just isn't. And we are talking about this earlier, I, I don't know whether I was talking with you about uh, so many of our students who are engaged now in my program uh, in social innovation. And, you know, they have they're convinced that if you have a really good idea in the social sphere, social sector, if we want to even call it this, it'll self-execute like the sham wow. I don't know whether you know the sham wow, but it's the latest little thing, the pet rock. Oh, I had this idea. It, it took off. They have this market notion that good policy is going to be recognized and adopted as if, and it, 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 it is a product of a uh, very, uh, cumbersome process and we ended up saying that you know we need to pay more attention to the basics of designing good policy and executing it well and that's expensive so I, I don't I wouldn't point to anything I'm concerned today about uh, you know the skill gaps in the federal government which are quite severe and they're not going to get any better uh, the competition for talent is uh, very uh, significant but government especially the federal government uh, that I study has to be more aggressive uh, in giving um, younger public servants a chance to make a difference in their lives because they're not going to wait around. So I don't know if that's not really answering the question. It's just like, it's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could go for an hour. <laughs> there you go. Uh, well, that actually brings up an interesting point about the kind of talent gap. And you've also written about you know, changes needed to the, the SES, the Senior Executive yeah. Service. Um, so could you talk a little bit about how you know, government can attract and retain the best people, right, given that it will never be able to pay what the, pri what the private sector can? Well, I, I, was, I was saying earlier that, that I, I, I did a study some years ago looking at cohorts of students at the uh, top public policy and public administration uh, schools around the country, dating back to the early 70s when many were created um, by a big Ford Foundation grant. And we studied cohorts over time. And back in the 1970s, when you went to a public policy school, public administration school, you went to governor and you stayed. There you go. 
um, <laughs> by the cohort that we uh, interviewed in the early 90s, uh, you didn't necessarily go to government. It was a multi-sector uh, public service by that point. Uh, some, of, some of you would go to nonprofits, some would go to uh, businesses, Deloitte, well, yeah, even Deloitte. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, and, and, and some state and local, this and that, business, you name it. Um, and we're st not only were they going to different destinations, they were uh, staying uh, for less time. More turnover, they, there was, the public service was becoming a sector, non-destinational community. Like, you know, non-denominational. They were non-destinational. They, they wanted to be able to move, to go where the action was, and it wasn't always government, and it wasn't always nonprofit or whatever. I'm going to go make a difference with my life, and I don't care what that is. I'd like to be able to pay back my debt, uh, for sure. Um, and sector switchers, moving. Uh, moving around every five to ten years from our biographical work with them. So how do you get these kinds of the, the, the talent we need in government? Well, we have to start thinking that maybe it's not a 35-year career with government. Because we have a straight up entry point kind of system. We bring you in at the beginning of career and you're supposed to stay until you leave or otherwise depart these earthly bonds. So we don't have lateral entry for the most part. We don't allow you to come in at mid-career. You can come in in the senior executive service in a uh, non-civil service or um, uh, sort of an open kind of uh, position come in as a member, a uh, senior executive, a political appointee or whatever, but we've long relied in the federal government on a sing single entry point, stay with it, you can move around agencies, but don't leave, because if you leave, it's going to be hard to come back, and I think that has to change. I just think it has to change, we haven't figured out how to do it yet. Um, the, the, the federal government, just to give you an example, I mean, is having terrible problems recruiting uh, in the under 30 age range. 7% of federal employees are under 30 right now. That strikes me as a little bit off. Um, I think there are more than 7% of Americans in the workforce. We just don't have much room because the baby boomers, we're not going anywhere. And those of you who think we are, you're wrong. <laughs> I don't know. It is true that I won't even ride in an elevator with a millennial. <laughs> they want us out. You know, like, we're not going anywhere. We're just not going anywhere. So part of the problem in the federal government with recruiting talent is that the hiring process is slow. USA Jobs, any of you ever been to USA Jobs? How was that for you? <laughs> kind of drive you nuts? You know, like, it, if you wanted to design a job board system to discourage people from entering, you would design USA Jobs. It's gotten, it's gotten better, but it's got a long way to go. Do you know what I'm talking about? Only too well. We can talk about that afterwards. Okay. Uh, you know, we're trying, but um, we've got these problems, and I think we need to get more into a rotational system, but it's going to be hard to design because we've got all sorts of, of issues of uh, public benefit and protection, uh, you know, uh, protections of, of basic uh, systems and operations. And I mean, we've got to be careful about it, but the workforce is changing faster than the federal personnel system. So if we want you, we've got to give you challenging work. We've got to give you decent wages. When we make a promise to you, let me say, if we say that if you stick with us for 10 years or whatever, uh, we're going to forgive your debt, your federal student loans. If we say that, then you can't have a president come in and say, ah, I'm not feeling like it uh, right now. When we make an agreement, we've got to honor it. And so we've got a lot of work to do here, and I'm worried about it because it's happening quickly. The baby boomers, there is some evidence that the baby boomers uh, just recently in the last quarter uh, kind of an interesting spike in the number of retirements. Um, and that could be the beginning of what we think 
is the retirement tsunami. We've been talking about it forever. In 1988, Mr. Volcker um, and his commission were saying, like, there's a quiet crisis. We use that language. And if I may just say parenthetically, he's one of the best writers I've ever worked for. Uh, he's just elegant in his prose. He, he he's, was always able to correct everything, uh, as long as it was in courier type. He's <laughs> uh, just brilliant. He came up with the idea, well, we have to address this quiet crisis. Not enough people are coming, too many are leaving, not, not enough are considering careers in government. This is, um, 1988, so we're in the 30th anniversary week almost of that report, and uh, we've been talking about it for a long time. Well, those baby boomers have aged to the point where there's time to think, yeah, maybe, maybe it's time to go, uh, maybe it's time to uh, go uh, take care of the grandkids, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. And there may be, I mean, they're going to leave sooner or later, uh, and the question is what we do to to recruit the next uh, crew, and then allow for this rotation. Because contractors are now, uh, there are now two and a half contract jobs for every federal. We just did the data runs on this, and we're, we're, we're trying to figure out what to do about it. I'm not sure I answered your question. I, I guess I confirmed <laughs> that your question is a damn good question <laughs> that deserves an answer. But we are really, I think we're really struggling in the federal uh, government right now. Uh, less so at state and local, but you know, uh, it's, 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 it's a tough time. It's really a tough time. Uh, so the, on that question of, of contractors, I was wondering if you could um, speak, because you wrote a very interesting white paper um, consistent with the work that John Julio has done on kind of the growth of contractors and some of the problems that causes. Could you talk a little bit about how that kind of affects governance as well as kind of broader issues of trust in government? Well, I mean, uh, John Julio has uh, written some really good uh, work on, uh, done some really good work on the de facto, de facto feds or proxy feds, those kinds of things. And the federal government has a very large workforce uh, of federal civil servants, um, contractors, and grantees. We don't often talk about grantees, but the federal government would be nowhere without its nonprofit partners, its university partners. Uh, organizations like the Rand Corporation, which I know pretty well, which is a nonprofit uh, that does a lot of research, uh, you know, academics who are doing research and so forth. Um, if you look at the uh, zero tolerance policy uh, that the Trump administration pursued, a, a lot of the people who were taking the children and caring for them were nonprofits, and very large ones. There were several very large organizations that were in the business of taking care of uh, uh, young of children who had been separated from their parents. That's what they did. And these 10 cities that the president has talked about, uh, I'm not sure who will staff them out, um, but we, we depend on this kind of mixed uh, sectoral, multi-sectoral workforce, and we have for a long time. And I think that, that we are going to continue to rely on that workforce. Um, we use contractors sometimes to deal with um, uh, surges in mission critical activities, but they've been around uh, since the Revolutionary War, and nonprofits have been around since the uh, Revolutionary War. Uh, de Tocqueville talked about Americans always forming associations when he uh, traveled through the United States in the early 1800s, and many of those associations were delivering services for government. Uh, or communities at the time, and they still do. The, the issue for the federal government on its contract and grant workforce is do we have the right people in the right jobs with the right accountability and the right skills? And how much of the contract and grant workforce is there because of uh, uh, unwarranted influence, sought or unsought, which is uh, Dwight Eisenhower's, uh, th that's, the language from Dwight Eisenhower's uh, farewell address in 1961, where he brought up the issue of the military-industrial complex. What I now argue is that we have a government-industrial complex. The federal government, many state and local governments cannot make a move without significant support from uh, nonprofits, grantees, 
and uh, private firms and quasis of one kind or another. I mean, so we've got to adjust in how we teach and understand the policy making process to understand how interwoven this all is. Uh, the consulting communities, the uh, hardware communities, a lot of people when I talk about contractors and government think about metal vendors, you know, metal vendors, the people who make stuff like fire aircraft and um, computers and so forth, but uh, a much more significant number of contractors and grantees are delivering services to the federal government. Uh, one of the ways the Obama, uh, one of the ways the Trump administration has sought to decimate Obamacare was what? To stop paying nonprofits to help enroll citizens in Obama who needed help. All these service centers that had been created in the first rounds of Obama care enrollment seasons, uh, these were nonprofits that were working with citizens to say, okay, we're gonna help you go through this computer system and try to figure it out, gone. You know, just gone, and the enrollment period was shortened. That was uh, deliberate. Uh, you know, if you wanted to stop a program from working, this is what you would do. Which is why some people are nervous about the new acting attorney general, who said the way to stop the Mueller investigation was to starve it. Which, is, of course, of course, that makes sense. Um, so, if you want to stop enrollment in a uh, uh, complicated program. Um, we're doing our open enrollment at NYU right now, and you know I have to do it in small bits. There's so many choices, and I, I can't. Oh, for health insurance. Oh my yeah. gosh! You know, oh my gosh! You know, uh, what kind of socks do I have on? <laughs> um, so you know, we know how to do that, and contractors and grantees are involved in a lot of that. Um, so uh, these are pernicious problems, and I've been saying, well, the first thing we need to do in the federal government, public service, is to acknowledge that we have a multi-sector public service. Stop it now. It's not only civil service. It's the big firms, the good ones, the bad ones, the, the consulting agencies, and so forth. I will tell you one thing. I, I gave a talk to a consulting, a bunch of, a uh, consulting firm had me in. This is great. Um, I haven't been invited back, as I said. <laughs> I just want you to know how proud I am of the work you do as public servants. And they were just like outraged. You know, we're not public, you know, we're, we're contractors. You know, I'm like, what do you think you, you all are doing? You know, they are public servants, uh, if you want to use that term. And many of them are highly dedicated um, and uh, deeply committed to the missions uh, that they're deployed on. We shouldn't. We shouldn't uh, think otherwise. There are bad uh, contractors, and there are people who uh, skirt the rules, and we need good investigatory uh, systems for watching them. But um, I don't. I, I've wandered off here. In the <laughs> it's a complicated system, and I think right now that we have about seven and a half million uh, contract grant and. Uh, federal civil servants, uh, and we carry about two million of that total as government employees. But year after year after year, it's the same contracts and, and grantees doing wonderful work, um, and we should be aware of it and then start thinking about the multi-sector workforce, um, how we oversee it, how we choose who gets what jobs, We've had an ongoing fight about this for years in, uh, you know, our uh, federal procurement uh, rigs. Oh my goodness! You know what is an inherently governmental position? You seem to be smiling because you know these words. She's a, she's a procurement person. What? She's a procurement person. Well, what is it? <laughs> you know, what, what is it? So the eight or nine panels bringing that up, right? They're asking Congress to relook at professional services, and let's just accept that we have professional services and not make it so difficult. Well, yes. I mean, I, I read... Because you're right. Oh, my, I just, you know, and I, I'm sure I'm going to get blasted. I wrote a chapter in this book um, uh, on this workforce saying, well, first we have to put everybody on the table, every right. employee, and then we have to decide which... <laughs> 
the concept of inherently governmental is like, it, it's like, it, there's no, I, the definitions are very specific, it's adjective abuse. Right, well, right, yeah. we can't figure it out. Nobody can. Yeah. So maybe we need a new uh, concept. I'm so glad to meet somebody who's uh, totally <coughs> in this so Yeah, in the government, and we don't, we can't figure it out. It's very um, situational. Yes, exactly, yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just to give like one, the concrete example I give when I, I do this lecture for my undergrads is that you might think of Catholic charities as this thing that if you're Catholic, you give money to, or they do a little appeal uh, in mass, right? They'll send you a little you know, pamphlet, so I grew up Catholic, um, right? But fully 45% of their budget is from the federal government, right? They do tons of work with homeless outreach, with soup kitchens, right, with transitional housing, right, uh, foster care, right, they run these huge federal programs, right, and it seems essentially like it's a charity, and in fact it is, right, and part of its money does come you know, from the church and from donations, right, but almost half of its budget's coming, right, from all of us, from our federal, you know, tax dollars, right, so part of what this allows the, the federal government to do, and I'll get off my own soapbox in a minute, um, you can tell I've spent a lot of time with John D. over there. Uh, right, because uh, this is like his big topic, right, is that it allows us to, to have more of these programs funded by the federal government, but not have to confront that these are in fact federal programs. So you have to question, oh no, they're these you know, private sector firms, but in reality, right, it's this sort of public-private kind of hybrid and partnership. I, I love uh, John Delio. It's just a, a dear friend, and um, I write in this, this current work, I say, John is an optimist and I the pessimist. Um, John really thinks that we can get this squared away and I'm so confused uh, by some of these distinctions. Um, you're quite right about Catholic Charities. Um, we want Catholic Charities involved, um, but how do we do it? So in a sense I'm saying, well, these 7.5 million uh, FTE, which is really what we're talking about, uh, full-time equivalent uh, employees, is um, this is our public service. Now, when you go down to the state level, it's totally uh, opaque. States don't keep records of any kind that we can use uh, with an estimator to uh, develop headcounts. Um, I'm blown away uh, by it. I work with some state and local people on it and it's kind of like what you don't know can't help you. We don't know who the contractors are but it's at the, at the local level. And again, I don't think it's a bad thing to have contractors and grantees. I think that's a good thing. The question is how do you oversee them and who should do what and when is a job so uh, intimately related, here I'm giving you the, the definition, so intimate, intimate, intimately related to the public benefit that it should only be performed by a federal employee. I think I've got it pretty close to. Uh, right, the, yeah. the actual decision has to be made by the government. Yeah, but so we got to deal with it now. How does it affect us who want to pursue, pursue public service careers? Well, and how does it affect government? It, it argues for a more pliable system that allows people to flow back and forth as their careers change. The problem being that the federal government uh, for certain kinds of jobs just doesn't pay enough and it's not fast enough. Uh, the hiring process is slow. We've already talked about USA jobs, so we've gotten over that headache, but it's, it's slow. Um, you know, the, 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 the movement up in terms of promotions and so forth can move you to a, a relatively um, healthy salary level, but it doesn't expand. You, we got all sorts of issues that we gotta deal with. Um, and I think we're gonna get around to it, but I think it's, I'm not sure this is the administration that we want to uh, engage um, on it. I, I don't know what to do about it, I'm, I'm still thinking. Um, so. so, all right, well then that, that leads to another set of questions. So, what, are there steps that even if the Trump administration doesn't move, want to move forward that the 116th Congress could take um, to start addressing uh, these issues? Well, there's a kind of a, a, a small set of issues that, not small, but more precise set of issues dealing with the federal service. Uh, 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 
President Trump has addressed some of this, you know, in the Veterans Administration case by arguing that we need to fire faster. We should use probation, pro probationary periods more aggressively. We can do some things to accelerate the review process, to be more aggressive on it, and I think a lot of federal advocacy groups have agreed that the there are certain parts of the personnel process that need to be fixed and maybe uh, we can get some action on it. My dilemma, this is what I'm pessimist, um, some of my colleagues will say, yes, the time for bipartisan uh, civil service reform, and that's only part of this uh, uh, issue. The time is now. It's been 40 years since the last time we reformed the system, 1978. It's been 70 years since the last time we uh, adjusted the federal pay system, 1946. Um, I think it was 46. Some people say 48, but I believe that was 46. Um, that's parenthetical, of course. Um, anyway, the, uh, I don't think the fact that something is old means it has to be fixed. But, of course, you can see why I would have that self-interested position. Um, uh, so uh, I'm not sure that we can have bipartisan reform on these issues in this environment. These tools that we talk about fixing, even USA Jobs, even USA Jobs, one can say that it can be fixed to discourage service, it can be fixed to encourage service. And I'm wondering whether or not there's a potential for bipartisan reform that could be helpful when you have uh, dedicated um, advocates in this debate who would prefer not to have an effective public service. Now, will they say it? Do, do they want to step forward and say, yeah, you know, we'd like to have uh, not so much the best and the brightest. I don't know, I'm struggling with that question. Do we want to work can we work across the uh, across the uh, party lines to find reasonable fixes to some of these problems? I, I'm, I'm in a way to see. I think the fact that we now have a um, Democratic House with Democratic chairs, uh, especially the Government uh, Oversight and Investigations Committee, uh, which I think is going to be its name. They changed. They've been changing their names uh, over the last 15 years quite frequently that particular committee. Could we get some bipartisan reform? Maybe. Maybe we could get it from the United States Senate. Um, maybe we can build a, a firewall against the national instinct to say, well, we want reform, but only if you get a 30% federal job cut. I, I, I'll tell you what happened here is that, in, in, you know, the federal uh, civil service headcount has remained at or near two million since 1951. Why? Well, in 1950, an obscure Congress, uh, member of Congress, Jamie Whitten from Mississippi, engineered passage of the Whitten Amendment uh, to a Korean War funding bill that said the federal government workforce shall not exceed two million. Now that thing has been repealed several times in history, but it has never gone away. It's a classic ratification. We tried to get rid of it, it was repealed, but by golly, it is in the blood of the presidential selection process. Don't go over two million. Uh, Obama did. Uh, Clinton took it down. Obama, Bush brought it back. You know, so we've got that two million, and then we expand the mission. And who's gonna do that job if you've got to hold to two million? If that's the fixed number, then you're gonna have to expand with contractors and grantees. And so I think that the, the starting point is to say we've got a workforce of 7.5 million. It's not all full-time uh, permanent. It's not all civil service. It's not all contractor. It's not all grantee. Let's start with that, multi-sector workforce. And we were moving towards it in the early 2000s and maybe we can get back to it. The problem is this is a partisan issue. If you're anti-government, what are the metrics you can use? to describe how big government is. Well, the one you should use, or might use, is the size of the federal budget or the debt, but Americans don't understand that very well. You know, can you know we've got a multi-trillion dollar debt. How much is that in dollar bills piled? Well, 
we, when you pile them up, it takes us to the third solar system past the 15th galaxy. <laughs> it's Stephen Hawking territory. <laughs> what they understand is jobs. The federal government added jobs during the recession. How dare they? And they are now this way. And maybe we can get to a different kind of headcount debate. I, I do have ideas for this, uh, and I've written about them, but I'm guessing that I'm going to get uh, uh, pretty well uh, bounced around with them because people are going to say, oh, you're in favor of contractors, or you're in favor of this, or you're trying to protect feds. And I'm saying, let's start with the total workforce approach. You're all public servants. Where should you go? Where can we use you best in, in a more pliable system? But that's not the only government reform we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, you know, even um, doing doing some of the stuff you talked about earlier in terms of could we reform like this in your executive service, yeah. make it easier for people to transition in yeah. and out. Um, I mean, any of those, do you see any prospects? I don't know. You might be able to get something there. I, I, I'm thinking of Mr. Volker, who always refers to uh, uh, things, uh, when I, where I grew up, it was, you know, that's really small potatoes. Mr. Volker says, says, that's really small beer. And I'm like, I get it. You know, so civil service reform is a tiny speck in, in this to some extent. The mission of government, uh, how we deliver services, uh, these are also very important. So it's a big ticket item. Now, I wanted to speak to this issue because I think I told you that I was trending. Did I tell you that we, maybe it was you that was, we've been trending a question, a set of questions for 20 years now on whether Americans want a bigger government that delivers more stuff or a smaller government that de delivers less stuff. That's one question. And the other question is, do you think the federal government, agree, disagree on uh, which of the following statements you prefer, um, I didn't write them, but once you write a good question or a bad question, they, they must be asked repeatedly far into the future. True? Trent is your friend. Trent? I've never heard that. <laughs> it's, it's good. <laughs> That's a Lipinskyism. We can coin that. Yeah, Trent is great. Um, I was arguing with somebody about the use of the term ecosystem with innovation. He kept using it. I said, I can't take this anymore. It's too much of a buzzword. And he says, the ecosystem demands that you use ecosystem. And I was like, it's the same kind of trend. Um, so the second question uh, that's been asked for some time is, uh, which of the following statements do you, uh, it comes closer to what you think, uh, um, the federal government needs very major reform. Now, you tell me who came up with that. Very major? Um, yeah, yeah, of course you didn't, because you're one of the best in the best. I, I do want to congratulate you for your work. I, I really do. I'm not being a joker here. This work that NBC did on Tuesday was the best in the field. That's my opinion. Please don't quote me on it. <laughs> no, it's a wonderful. Don't go on all the promotional materials. <laughs> it, was, it was great. Wow, really good. Um, this, this, the first question was very major reform. You got to stick with it. The second was uh, that um, I'm basically content and think it only needs some reform needs only some reform. And the third one was, doesn't need any reform. So when you take the top two categories, the, the third one is kind of a throwaway, um, and you cross it with uh, bigger government, smaller government, you end up with four reform philosophies that are out there in the American public. In 1998, when Bill Clinton um, was in office, uh, 1997, when this pairing was first used, sort of, um, most Americans were in the federal government, doesn't need much reform, only some, and we want bigger government. These were what I call the expanders. It was a kind of the heyday of, you know, government's working pretty well, and you know, we should give enough money to get things done. By, 19, by 2016, the number one category was people who said the federal government needs very major reform, and we want it to be smaller and deliver less stuff. I call these folks the dismantlers. Tear it down, you know, and, at, and when, uh, in August 2016, when these questions were run, 46% uh, of Americans said, uh, we're dismantlers as I define them. Uh, the people, the expanders, were pretty much gone. Um, 
And uh, there was a second group of rising which said, we need very major reform and we want bigger government and more stuff. Now, uh, last uh, October, we did those questions again. And the dismantler, the number of dismantlers was down by a third. Mm -hmm. Trump had driven out a lot of people uh, who believe in very major reform and want smaller government. Now, we're still trying to figure out why that happened. And the number of people who said, boy, we really want more government and very major reform, which I call the people I call the rebuilders, was up. They're in a rough statistical uh, tie. So I would say, and again, you can correct me on this, I'm probably violating every standard, uh, you know, don't do the business. Um, Trump has divided us on many things, but he has brought us together on the desire for very major reform in government. 65% <laughs> of the respondents uh, said we want very major reform. And then they split into these two groups, uh, the ones who want dismantling and the ones who want rebuilding. And I could make the argument, though I wouldn't do it just yet, that the 2020 election is going to be about that issue in some ways. You can always see it. I don't know how Elizabeth Warren got to this position, but she's talking about ethics. Pelosi last night on CNN. Ethics, ethics, ethics. We've got to clean things up. And it's almost a return to my favorite presidential candidate in this space, Jimmy Carter. I'm thinking by my reading, I know I'm, by, I'm not violating rules here. Uh, I don't think Americans are going to want a Bernie. I think they want a Jimmy. And Carter talked about a government as good as the people. He had a positive message on uh, leadership, and he also talked about the need for major reform. And that was the last period of major government reform. Ethics in government, uh, the Inspector General Act. So, you know, I'm a sort of public management design kind of person, so I'm obviously seeing things here that might not be accurate, but I think this is a period where you could actually get some reform, and the question is what do we got to, to get? And we just haven't been working on it uh, as, diligent, as diligently as we could have, but I could see uh, the Democratic House wanting to produce legislation uh, to, re to rebuild the ethics system, strengthen the inspectors general, uh, rebuild the civil service system. The question again, as I said earlier, do we really want to work with these kinds of reform and turn them over for implementation to an administration that has expressed its opposition to these reforms? And I don't know what to do about it. I, I'm going to leave it to, to, to you to think it through. Is it worth the gamble? that we could author and produce legislation over the next two or three years that would fundamentally rebuild these systems and then say, okay, uh, let's run on it. Um, I don't know, I really don't know. It's you know, question, I'm looking at my colleagues here saying, you know. Well, you yeah. have to pass it first. Yeah, you gotta pass it. And it's, you know, the House was the author of many of these statutes. Jack Brooks, uh, a giant of uh, public management and the government ops committee, as it used to be called before we started changing the name, um, they did a lot of this work. And the office management budget had the capacity uh, to fuel these reform ideas. There, were, there was a lot of energy out there around these things in the wake of the Nixon or the Nixon resignation. If you look at the two periods side by side, today versus 1974, 75, as Carter was starting his run, um, there are parallels, but there are significant differences, and I'll leave that to others to think about. Carter did say something in his 1996 acceptance speech. I wrote a column about this, and I put a hot link in the column. I said, everybody should watch the last five minutes of Carter's acceptance speech. And somebody wrote me, Twitter is so mean. <laughs> 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 Excuse me for swearing, but somebody wrote like, "What a fool you are!" <laughs> and then said something like, "You peanut head." Like that. You know, like, That's pretty nice for Twitter. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I'm not sure the word was peanut. <laughs> so that's it. I'm not going to go any further. But it's really nasty out there. I, I just, you know, it's just really nasty.
solid. No, I mean, I, I, the one, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll comment for one second, but one interesting potential for reform that actually has come from a lot of, uh, we'll say conservatives more than Republicans on this line, has been strengthening the, um, the civil service as it relates to Congress, right? So initially this kind of grew out of people like uh, Kevin Kosar at, at Art Street and some others, who basically said, oh, we need to rebuild Congress so they can, in effect, combat the president. Of course, they were thinking about the Obama presidency, right, which they viewed as too big, right? But, I, like, that idea is now, you know, kind of out there and percolating, like Lee Drutman and Steve Tellis have also um, kind of been, been working on this, but this sort of sense of you, you need to confront the workforce as it is, but also make sure that it can do and can deliver on the mission um, that you have and that, uh, Cutting isn't always the, the best idea. Well, the, the uh, Chris Van Hollen, who I, I, I like, and I like Drutman's work too. Van Hollen in, in 2015 was demanding that CBO start to measure the headcount of con the contract and possibly the grant workforce because people were coming at him at, at Congress with ideas for 10% across the board cuts in federal FTE, and we know exactly how many people are in the federal workforce. We, it's in the budget every year, we can see it, we don't know how many are in the contract and grant workforce. It's kind of like, we don't wanna know. Uh, now, we have a estimating methodology, which isn't perfect by any means, but we can get a good handle on it, and we know there might, there are seven and a half million estimated uh, contractors, grantees, and feds, so, Part of what I think you were, I thought you were leading to is that Congress doesn't have the capacity to write laws on this no, uh, anymore. at all. The staff has been decimated, uh, just decimated. Um, alleged council staffs who write laws uh, in trouble, CRS, uh, you know, you, you know uh, was, was dismantled at many levels. You know, there's still good people at CRS, but a lot of people were forced out, there was this, terrible uh, period of, like, you can't tell Congress what you think. And a lot of CSR pe uh, CRS people were driven out because they, they were taking positions. Uh, people like Lou Fisher wasn't driven out, but he was taking positions on what the war power should be and how you exercise that power. And the Congress uh, bore down, members of Congress bore down on CRS, uh, said stop that, GAOs, staff, the Government Accountability Office, which I think is a first-rate source of uh, deep counsel on these issues, terrific crews. Uh, they've been cut from about 5,500 FTE to 3,500, maybe 3,250. They're still cutting on these issues, the high-risk list, all these things that we use, but they're under fire. The congressional staff uh, cut to ribbons. So the question is, and OMB, they used to have an administrative uh, um, uh, sciences crew uh, that was part of the reorg. You know, presidents have reorganization authority until 1984 uh, when the uh, Supreme Court said no, that's a violation of the Constitution. Congress writes the law, not the president, um, et cetera, et cetera. They, their administrative uh, divisions decimated, and in 19. Uh, uh, 96, 97, uh, OMB actually took their management people and pushed them down into the budget ranks because the thought was, and I thought, you know, it's, it's a hypothesis that made sense that you should have management people down in the budget units, program budget office uh, units, um, so that they could marry management with budget. It didn't work out that way. So I'd say, like right now, who's gonna write this stuff? You don't want me to write it. Um, I was accused of being a sloppy uh, legislative uh, staffer when I, I wrote some legislation back, way back when, and some federal judge had the temerity to say that uh, the legislation we drafted was sloppy. How dare they? <laughs> <laughs> so one of the questions is, like, do we have the capacity to write stuff like this? And I think it's a good one. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's a, I often tell students that my biggest bias is not my partisan bias, it's my constitutional bias, and that it's that I actually want Congress to, to do more, right? Because I think if you look at the Constitution, right, the, the framers 
wrote Article 1, it's much longer than anything else that, that's in there, right? Because they saw Congress as sort of the sine qua non of the, the federal government, right? And they viewed that as much more important than the president. I know, like, I, when I tell that to 18 year olds, they just kind of roll their eyes and, like, look at me. But like, if you go back and look at it, that's really true, right? That they viewed it that way. And I think that, um, especially if you view yourself as, as, you know, as someone who takes the Constitution seriously, you have to at least, at least grapple with that. Uh, it's going to take some time, Let's, you know, because we're talking a lot about investigations now on Capitol Hill, and uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi, others are saying we, we're going to really bring the investigatory uh, uh, process back to life, oversight, uh, those kinds of things. But you know what? There, there currently isn't the staff to do that. They're going to have to do a lot of hiring. Because the notion was we, we don't need staff to investigate, we just need to yell at people. And I'm not saying that's a Democratic thing or a Republican thing. I mean, there's been a lot of yelling going on, but if you want a good investigation, you've got to have uh, you know, workhorses, people who know how to uh, extract information, collect information, the, the Lee Hamiltons, the uh, Waxmans, um, the giants of uh, investigation over the last 30 years, they knew how to work the investigatory process, and it is, it is a legal process, you know, and uh, the use of the subpoena power, uh, you know, it's, it's not something that you can just say, oh, I want to do a subpoena. It's a complicated process. And we don't teach students enough who are going into the public service about these legal issues. You know, what is a law? How is it done? How do you ratify? How do you deliver within the law? Um, so it's going to take some time for the House to ramp up its investigatory capacity the real question that we should all be watching is the lag time. I mean, if, if on uh, January 4th, we, we, the new Congress arrives on the 3rd, they're gaveled in, are you going to see a subpoena issued? And if there is, watch out. Because in, in order to issue a subpoena, you want to have some evidence uh, already collected. That's where good investigations come from. But I, I don't know. It's going to be a fun ride, that's for sure. <laughs> And important. I agree with you on the comments. Um, okay, so before we turn over the, the students, I wanted to ask one, one final question in a slightly um, different vein. So we've got a, an audience here of, of MPAs. So what advice would you give them, based on your sort of long career, um, to become more effective uh, public managers and leaders in this kind of government and nonprofit sector? You're not going to like what, I, what I'm going to say. Somebody just ain't going to like it. Uh, just you're not going to like it. Uh, you better know how uh, to calculate uh, impact. You better take your stats seriously. You better learn how to interpret a randomized control trial. You need to know how to measure outcome. Um, my students are like, oh God, I gotta take that stats course. I hated stats. I was, I mean, I just hated it. It was really hard for me, really hard for me. And uh, I, I did my best to master it. Um, we have too many people going into the public service writ large who are terrified of that. And I get it, believe me, I get it. Uh, but um, that's the most common complaint I get from our students at Wagner. Why do I have to take that stuff? And I say, well, you need to be able to detect the BS in the equations that are coming at you. Because people are gonna appear before your subcommittee and say, well, this equation tells us that this is right. So you gotta take that seriously and get conversant. Um, I had one student that I, I talked to this about, she said, well, I, I don't need that stuff. And I said, well, how are you gonna know what's a good, uh, you know, what the right, you know, what to do? And she said, well, I trust everybody. I, <laughs> wow, wow, is that for real? I mean, should we? You know, so I say, don't worry about it, get into it and accept it as part of it. And then always remember why you're here. You know, if you're not driven by the chance to make a difference for this sorry world, you're gonna be kind of kind of unhappy, suffering in this effort. There is this kind of notion of basic meaning, so heavy reality and kind of understanding why you're here. Um, I don't regret a single, uh, uh, you know, step in this process that I've taken. I, I love doing what I do. And, Find that part too. Enjoy what you're doing. If you're suffering, then you know maybe you should do 
something else, maybe, or figure out why you're unhappy. Isn't that a weird thing to say? You know, <laughs> get on top of stats. <laughs> Remember who you up. are and love. <laughs> yeah. But I, you know, it's 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 a real, you know, and some might say, well, facts don't matter anymore. We're not that far from that reality just yet. I, I think we can. Even though you said you were a pessimist before. I am a pessimist about reform. Oof. <laughs> uh, yes. All right, so let's open it up to uh, questions from the audience. What questions do you guys have? Professor Light. Yeah, Great. Hi. Uh, my name is Madeline O'Brien. I'm a full time second year student, also aspiring federal bureaucrats. So We're really excited to hear tonight. And um, the topic that I'm interested in actually performing research on is factors that prevent students early in their careers from going into the public sector, like when they're deciding early in college or perhaps graduate school. And I'm wondering, what can institutions do, especially institutions in places like Penn that get big donations that have to go to Wharton or have to go to programs that filter people in the private sector to make sure that people who want to study the public sector are supported and also, what are your thoughts on using the nonprofit tax exemption for universities as a potential hook to encourage universities that have to invest more money in public sector programming, given that they're taking that money from the government? Well, I don't have a thought on that. I, I do want to, to read your, your paper when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great paper. Uh, so what are the disincentives for service? And you know, what I'd look to if I were, were, were you is to the, the, the the good research on what motivates pers a person to take a job uh, in the private sector or public sector. Um, and there's good research, good, solid, uh, statistically valid research. I mean, everybody likes to say, well, you know, what a wonderful generation the millennials are, and I do like the millennials a lot. Uh, you know, they put working for a company that they love higher than anything. Well, when you actually run the regressions and you start controlling, it's the paycheck. You know, and then, you know, you want, it's kind of more of a kind of a, a stacked set of, of issues. I mean, the federal government are in, and government in general does a lot to discourage you from entering. You know, uh, the Presidential Management Fellowship, which would, would be wonderful for you. Applied already. Yeah, <laughs> how'd you do? Have you gone through it yet? I mean, um, yeah, the test opened last month. Good. The test. Do you want me to tell you what I was going to say? <laughs> I think I know what you're going to tell me, so well, I'm you know, it, it boggles the mind that you know you go through this process. It's a wonderful process. Then you go to the job fair, which you will because you're from Penn. You're very special. <laughs> Are you from Penn? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you get there. You get uh, invited to the job. You'll get. You'll be a finalist. And then you'll go down and you go to the job fair and you find out that there are jobs for only half of you, or maybe a third of you. Because federal agencies currently see you as a PMF as an offset from somebody who can actually do something that needs to get done. We have to take care of you, we have to rotate you, we have to give you opportunities to develop, and that is a cost. Now that's something we could fix with a, a simple piece of legislation that says PMFs are not an offset, not to be treated as an offset. They cannot be counted as an offset so that you can get a job. So uh, you should take a look at these disincentives. Whether we could help defray or reduce uh, your um, uh, tuition, those kinds of solutions, I'd love to see what you come up with. We should make it easier for people who want to go into government, whether they're at the most senior levels as presidential appointees or lower levels, whatever. We should make it easy for them to say yes. That's by making the application simple and so forth and so on. And we do a lot of backsliding in the federal government. We, we simplify and we allow you to submit a resume and then we decide no, we want you to cut the resume up and put it in the category, all that kind of stuff. We could make it a lot easier. But I'm suspecting that that's not the major driver uh, of why uh, people say, I don't want to apply. Could it be the environment? Could it be something else? One of the things we found out a couple of years ago, the Pew uh, Research Center did this big distrust survey. It's interesting that almost half of Americans, uh, well, I should 
say uh, a little less than half say that they, if they had a son or daughter, they would uh, not want them to go into politics, but they would want them to pursue a government career. That's because a lot of Americans love government, love what government uh, delivers and want it to work well, but they hate politics. Um, I think that's what uh, that survey was telling us, but what is it that would make you shy away? How much effect does uh, the current administration have on it? The belittlement of that, does that affect interest among your cohort in applying for a job, you know? Um, I, I really don't know. It'd be interesting to see what you discover there. Because that literature is a little um, unusual. Uh, I'll tell you one thing that we did discover. Uh, there's a whole literature on public service motivation. It's very interesting. Uh, uh, that students with high public service motivation who go to schools of public policy and administration end up wanting to go to the nonprofit sector more because they start to get exposed to what nonprofits do that makes them excited. They're given significant jobs, sometimes really awful jobs, you know, <coughs> stuffing envelopes and stuff, but they feel like they're part of something. And that's telling us something when you have public, high public service motivation and a change in destinational preference, then you say, well, what is it about government that's not doing that trick? And it could be that you go into these jobs, even as a PMF, and you're kind of not given uh, a play, and maybe that's gonna work out. And send me an email, I'm easy to find. I don't answer Twitter. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, send me an email and I'll, I'll give you a couple of those citations that you can look at on public service motivation. It was a stunner. Um, and uh, the people who came up with the public service motivation concept were shocked because they thought that PSM, as it's called, uh, would motivate more people to go to government, and that we would be uh, actors in that. And, and it turns out that maybe not so much because government doesn't have good co-op programs and internship programs. So maybe that's the answer. You know, I don't know. It's an interesting paper. I'd love to see it. Other questions? Um, in the beginning, you talked about the different factors that lead to the failure of government, underinvesting people, underinvesting projects. I'm curious to know where you think leadership skills falls into the range of those. I, I, so often, we see folks who are promoted based on their technical qual qualifications, particularly now at more and more into the SES, where um, when you go apply on USA jobs, they're asking for technical qualifications and not what the SES was originally designed to be. Um, so in the list of things that really are hurting our government from performing well, where do you think leadership skills falls in that? Well, I mean, you know, we went through investigatory reports, congressional investigations on these big failures. The 9-11 Commission, uh, the Benghazi investigation, it was really an investigation. Uh, those kinds of things. We, we really tried to understand, well, what were the GAO reports, all this stuff, trying to say, well, what were the proximate causes? And it turned out that there were lots of things. Bad policy is a big determinant. So better policy analysis will help. Now, you might not get that law passed that allows you to regulate, uh, let's say, uh, nitrates, uh, you know, fertilizer, uh, that doesn't put a limit on it in, in small fertilizer, mom and pop fertilizer, which is what destroyed West Texas bad policy, poorly implemented. So you start to get this cascade of stuff. Um, so, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to answer your question. Um, big issue for policy, bad leadership, just stupid decisions. Um, God, I, you know, if I have to read the 9-11 report again, you know, if you go to the heart of the 9-11 investigation, there's a single sense that says it was a failure of bad man bad policy, uh, you know, uh, bad oversight, and a failure of imagination. And it's just like, well, everything that could go wrong, we could have prevented it, uh, was the takeaway from Lee Hamilton um, uh, and uh, Kane, uh, the, the co-chairs. But it, it's hard to say. I mean, leaders are involved in this, and we ought to pay more attention to who they are and their qualifications. You see this rush. People say, well, Trump is so late on so many appointments, right? 
this has been an ongoing uh, uh, criticism of the administration that they're late, late, late with PAS, Presidential Appointee System, nominees. They are very late. They haven't been late on the Schedule C appointments. Schedule C is an at-will kind of position. Your Sched C, they're, they're, they're important, but Schedule C really doesn't say, oh, you have to know something. Those are the chiefs of staff, many of whom are non-career SES, which is an exempt category. So we heard all these, we saw all these reports, if you were following this, about the White House Office of Presidential Personnel. They were having beer parties. It was party time uh, in that office. They threw out everything that Chris Christie had done in advance. He had done a lot of work on who could be, you know, qualified. You're smiling, like, you know, right? You, You've seen all of this, like you know, oh yeah, the kids. Like they were playing beer pong. The kid the, who was like twenty two and yeah, in charge of who knows what. Twenty two year olds are perfectly capable of good decision making. It's hard to do <laughs> when, you're, when you're at a beer pong uh, party. It just you might not want to be making that decision at that point. So then you get all of these people filtering through. ProPublica has done wonderful work on this. If you really want to see the counts, they were very fast with their sked C's. Very very. Fast. Um, and that's because they knew those people were lever pullers and they would enforce the president's agenda. And some people thought they were spies. Um, and Whitaker is a good example of, I don't think he was Sked C. Does, do you know, do you, anybody know? Um, he was chief of staff. Some chiefs of staff were Sked C's. Others are non-career SES. Um, I suspect he was non-career SES at that level. But, uh, I mean, that, that's a big issue. And then you have those folks making decisions or not making decisions. So um, I told my friend back here, uh, way back, I, I was telling you about, I had this interview early in the Obama administration. Uh, the Obama administration got all their cabinet people, their senior officials into place and didn't move as quickly as they should have on the Schedule C's, the lower levels. And my, uh, uh, standard comment on that one was that the Obama administration was not so much headless as neckless, uh, which was hilarious at the time. Um, the Trump administration is, uh, ha is headless. A lot of senior people are not in place. And there's a certain philosophy that goes with that. If there aren't people there making decisions, you're not getting decisions and government fails. Better to have government not doing stuff than to do stuff, to enable it to faithfully execute the laws. And I think that takes us back to the constitutional question. What is the job of the federal government? Well, I think it's to faithfully execute the laws. If you don't like the law, then go change it. I, I just really believe that. Uh, and uh, um, I, I think that's uh, something that's being debated right now. You know, so anyway, you can unmake laws by not implementing laws. And that ain't, that ain't right, right? So. It's back to the old Aaron Rodofsky studies uh, from the 1960s. Yeah, yeah. Other questions? Yeah, Andrew. So I'm curious to get your opinion. I've been following this, this conversation somewhat closely on the idea of a mandated national service, right, for people that are out of, out of um, undergrad, whether it be go into the military, do some sort of AmeriCorps program, some sort of like give back to the, the community. Would you define this as a bad policy? <laughs> as, a, as a good idea, as maybe like a, a, an entry point, right, to get people into the pipeline to be, you know, career, career servants? Do you think that it's maybe a step too far, right? I'm just curious to get your, your perspective on, on it all. You know, I teach, I teach both required and elective classes at NYU, and I, I, I know the difference between the two. <laughs> I, I, I am always bouncing when I go into my class, elective class, because every student there decided to be with me, and I try my very best. I always uh, feel that the requirement power is overused in academia, sometimes not by anybody in this room. <laughs> <laughs> that is sometimes used to, and, and rightly so, to, to force students to take classes that they wouldn't otherwise take. Like stats. <laughs> Don't ever come to me for a waiver on that, uh, that uh, uh, class, those classes. But 
I don't know whether, I, I don't know whether we'd end up preaching to the converted or so to speak, preaching to the choir, uh, and whether we'd be doing uh, people in, involved in national service, um, whether it'd be a good thing, but there's good research on national service in other countries. There are a number of countries that require it, and we can see what they do. I've been spending time uh, looking at the uh, social innovation ecosystem in Israel, and if I hear one more time that while everybody is interested in innovation because they all serve, I'm like, I'm not so sure. Um, I'm just not, but there's some good research on it, and I thought the takeaway was it doesn't have much of an effect. Um, now TFA, Teach for America, did a big study a few years ago uh, on whether going through their recruitment summer led people to be more active citizens after leaving TFA, and the answer was no. That was a very controversy. You're shaking your head. A very yeah, controversial. So I'm a and teacher I mean, alum, so I'm familiar. What? With, I'm a teacher alum, so well, I'm familiar. Well, you know, with I, I know Doug McAdam, who did yeah. the the study um, out at Stanford, and TFA was none too happy yeah. to be told that their summer program was not like Freedom Summer. That people who went through it and uh, you know then matriculated and did the two years were less likely to participate in civic activities after than the people who were admitted but didn't matriculate. Now that was a hard thing to swallow and you know, but you know, there's that research. So I'd say, you know, pursue that a little bit further. I haven't seen, and if you've got something, send it to me. I haven't seen good work on national service in the United States for some years now. Am I wrong about that? So there was a conference a few years back, two years, maybe three years ago, that was held out in at Gettysburg College, right, where they were yeah. trying to discuss this and they had like, Wesley Clark from the military, and they'd like lots of different like thought leaders trying to come together and figure out like what would it look like and, and what could it be. And I think Aspen technically had, had sponsored it. Um, so there's discussions in the like intelligentsia, but I'm still not convinced that like from as the argument that you were making before from an implementation implementation perspective that like it could actually be a reality. Uh, yeah, and some people last night were saying Tuesday night we were talking about uh, um, mandatory voting again. Did you not hear that um, in all the discussions? I mean, some people were saying, ah, you know, turnout's too low over here, we need to, how, how's that worked out? Uh, so, I, I don't know. Um, anyway, other, other questions? I'm all that stands in the way of uh, uh, more time here and going out to that weather. <laughs> if someone takes my umbrella, I'm gonna be so upset. So, you know, for those of you who are going, you know, are here because you care about public service. The, it, it's, not an interest, it, uh, it's not an easy place to get in. Uh, this is a difficult moment in time, but if you, don't, uh, if you don't follow through, we're in a whole world of hurt. And there's a, uh, another issue about like passion for service, uh, belief, faith, all these kinds of things that come up. But, um, you know, there's an obligation here. Uh, we need your help. Uh, get as much as you can. Uh, yeah, I'll program. make a plug for a small book. So some of you who heard the thing that I did a couple weeks ago have uh, already heard me talk about it, but it's a super quick book. You can read it like in a weekend. Um, it's called The Fifth Risk by Michael Lewis. Uh, I saw that. It's, it's actually it's, it's very much worth reading. Some advice, right? Yeah. Um, so the you know I think the case it's actually something I want to assign to some of my undergrads because I think it helps show you the whole variety of things that the, the federal government does that no one knows and thinks about it makes a case for why they matter, right? So all the sorts of rural policies that we have, that uh, many of them administers we're talking about earlier through the um, private sector, but this whole array yes. of programs that we have to support, um, you know, sort of dying communities, it's sort of interesting to read that in light of all the discussions about um, how can we, you know, design programs to help reinvigorate these communities, well there already are Actually, a lot of these programs in place, just people don't necessarily know about them. You can make a big difference in this world. And I, you know, coming at this point in life, I don't have a single regret about pursuing. Now, I have a lot of frustration, uh, a lot of dead ends, but God, it's a great life. Oof. You know, to go in every day thinking that you might matter in some one person's life, I'm telling you, uh, it's a great uh, feeling. And can you make a little money at it? Yes, you can. Can you pay down your debt? We hope we'll help you do that. 
Um, and can you do it in different places? Absolutely, but you will not regret doing this. I just absolutely convinced of it and I've talked with enough people using reasonable methods to understand maybe it's delusion, but I think uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, career. I, didn't, I wasn't supposed to talk about the career though, right? Uh, you know, um, it's a great thing to do. I admire that you're here on a Friday night to hear me. <laughs> Give me a break. You know? <laughs> anyway, I, I'm so happy to be here. I do so respect these programs that you're in. So good luck to you. Okay, yes. We have time for one more question. Yes, yes. I have one question. I'm a, I am a student here. Okay. And as I mentioned, uh, you said like the Czech government is actually uh, giving less support to NPOs. And uh, actually, uh, as just like you mentioned, and the district also uh, had that uh, Czech is bringing back a larger government. So is there any connections? Between these two things is because the government is larger and it contains two more programs, so the NPOs is diminishing. Is that the case? Well, I, I think it's the opposite, isn't it? I mean, government has a very big mission. Yeah. We've constrained uh, the civil service. Um, don't have as many bodies there, and they're older, uh, so not as much of a front line. Um, that puts more pressure on the NPOs uh, to deliver, either in concert with government. Uh, or with uh, local support. Um, I think there's a, you know, a lot of flux in this system, a lot of movement back and forth right now, and uh, you want a job where you can make the most difference with your life. It may not be in the federal service any longer. It may have migrated. Or it might not be in nonprofits any longer. It might have come back. So we're gonna see a lot of flux as the baby boomers retire, and we are gonna leave. I'm not, but uh, <laughs> they, they are. Um, you know, there is going to be a significant turnover in the federal government over the next 10 years. No doubt about it, one way or the other. And that's going to shift and move responsibilities over the sectoral lines. And you're going to have to be watching for it and see where it is. Um, and uh, it's going to be a very exciting time to come in. We are going to refresh. We're hitting the refresh button and it's gonna happen at all levels of government. And that's a good thing, I think, yeah. about time. Would that also be a refresh of NPOs? NPOs or NPOs? Like Nonprofits. Yes. I mean, that's all happening. The baby boomers, you know, we often refer to them as like a pig in a python. Do you know what that image is? <laughs> well, you know, finally we're being digested. Uh, <laughs> metaphorically, uh, allegorically, and uh, literally. Uh, we are moving on, so the millennials are the next pig in the python. It's the generation represented here. A very large generation, and you're starting uh, to move into it, and you're going to be the problem for your offspring. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I'm not a booking. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Professor Light, oh. for coming out.